You're listening to the Write Project Podcast and Radio Program, a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR-FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew. Welcome to a very special episode of the Write Project Podcast. Today, we've got a host of authors on to answer one of the most frequent questions that's asked of any author. We're asking them, what was the first book that made you cry? And today to answer, we have on Matthew Daniels, frequent contributor to the From the Rock series, as well as the author of the upcoming novel, Diary of Knives. Uh, what is the first book that you ever read that made you cry, if any ever has? I've never been made to cry from from reading something, because I find that I am for like, like I'm kind of in control of my own imagination. Uh, so if I find that something is making me too uncomfortable, I can kind of uh, stop that emotional experience if I'm not enjoying it. That said, um, the big example that comes to mind of something that hit me hard was um, Angels Crying by Tom Moore. I read that as part of a sociology course in my undergrad, and uh, it's about uh, sexual abuse of girls in the Newfoundland foster care system. And the author, uh, his core argument was was what he called the ogre of silence. It's why a lot of these social issues go on for so long, because people are uncomfortable talking about them. And so his approach to this was to give full detail of everything that was done. Yikes. I put that book down and had to go for a walk. And I was late having supper that day. I was distressed because it's very different to read or watch or otherwise consume a story about terrible things happening to somebody when that person isn't a real living being. But when you find out that this is something that happens in the real world, possibly down the street from you, that's a whole other thing. Yep. Talking to him about that book a few weeks ago, he was at the uh, the Wannell uh, AGM, and uh, he had, um, looking at it there now, uh, that book uh, was actually self-published because he... um, a lot of the people he wrote about um, were, were like victimizers uh, were still alive, and uh, the publishers that he'd worked with before and the publishers that uh, that he wanted to bring it to wouldn't touch it because they were afraid it would be he would be sued, and they were asking him to change details and move things around so that he so to make it to make that less a possibility, and he he very much advocated for no this is it, the truth has to come out this is this is the way this has to be it has to be unapologetic in that way so he uh, he took the uh, the risk himself and and self published it well that's excellent yeah uh, shout out to him on that one yeah cuz that's you, you got to fight that kind of stuff yeah he just won uh, the Canada Reads for Newfoundland, I believe, for uh, the sign on my father's house. Flanker published that. It was uh, it was a wonderful book. I haven't gotten to reading that one yet, but uh, I might have to accidentally trip into a bookstore soon. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's got some amazing work. He's been all over. He was one of the first people published with Breakwater, like back in the seventies. He's um, he's he's had a long and and wonderful career. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have J.E. Solo. She recently just put out her novel, Freak. J.E. Solo, what is the first book you remember making you cry when you read it? Um, let me see. Yeah, I read a lot of crazy stuff when I was a kid, and there was, um, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a real soft spot for animals. I'm like hardcore vegan for many, many years. Um, and I had this friend who loaned me this book called Beautiful Joe. Oh. Um, and it's about this poor dog. <laughs> um, not unlike, you know, the Black Beauty kind of storyline. 
uh, of just this immense suffering by this creature at the hands of human beings. Um, and yeah, so terrible things happened to this poor dog in this novel, and I got very upset a few times. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So anything, uh, yeah, anything as a kid where uh, an animal was harmed, I was probably crying. Yeah, the most popular um, answer to that question, I could make a whole episode of people talking about this one book, is uh, Where the Red Fern Grows, and same thing, it's it's because there's a dead dog. Wow, I, I haven't read that one. Don't, uh, apparently. It's yeah. A, like, <laughs> no. I'm not kidding, 20 authors have answered Where the Red Fern Grows, and I'm like, this is wow. I should start a support group. This is just like a collective trauma. Wow. Yeah, there's nothing, yeah, well, not there's nothing sadder, I suppose, but yes, it's it's powerful, you know. Yeah, for sure. Powerful stuff. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Alicia Morrissey. She is the creative copy director at Rogue Penguin Creative, and she is a visual artist with the White Space Art Company, and also teaches visual art to youth. Alicia Morrissey, what is the first book that springs to mind, the first book you remember, that made you cry? <laughs> the first book I can rem- that, come- that springs to mind that made me cry is every book, because I often cry at the end of books, whether they end happily or horribly. Just because they um, ended? It's over. I don't want it to be over. I need more. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I also have a habit of, um, I, I like real books, paper books, because when I'm finished, I tend to, to toss them on the floor out of frustration because I'm done. Okay. Not because they were terrible, but I often give them a flick and you can't do that with your iPad. No, no, you cannot. Yeah. No, all, all the books make me cry. I see. What about Flowers yeah. for Algernon? Yeah, so you recommended Flowers for Algernon. I did not cry. No, I did cry at the end of that book, but I started crying like two thirds of the way through that book and didn't stop. Yeah. I read that book in one day. That's a really hard um, book. It, it was so emotional. It, it hit me like a like a freight train, and uh, yeah, it made me cry. Yeah. But I've been crying about ending books since I was little. Like, I cried at the end of Charlotte's Web, of course, when, spoiler alert, Charlotte dies. And, um, yeah, I, I I cry when the book ends. I, I can't help it. So Charlotte's Web is an interesting one because uh, I was recently um, helping tutor someone in grade four who was, who was learning to read. Mm. And they were reading Charlotte's Web with their dedicated reading instructor they had an actual reading instructor and i was helping on the writing side of things um what i found really interesting is i never really occurred to me because i read it when i was so young the genius of that book in that the entire setup the entire thrust is we have to stop wilbur from dying yeah and It emotionally prepares you the entire way. Like, I was watching this child read this book, and every day he would read a chapter with his instructor. And every day he would be like, is Wilbur going to die? Is Wilbur going to get out of this? And the instructor would say, well, we'll have to read more tomorrow and see. And I could see the genius of the novel because it spent the entire time focused on will this character or will die or not. Meanwhile, it ends with another character you've come to love, the one who's trying to save him dying. And it in no way emotionally prepares you for that. It's genius. Um, yeah, I really love that book because, again, you you, you hit on the, the note of pacing. And, and it does a really good job of that. Charlotte's Web is such a great book to teach young writers how to write because it, it does that. It has that that flip of, of perspectives where you are so desperate that Wilbur, Wilbur live, but at the end, your, your most beloved character, Charlotte, who has done everything for him, does die. It, it also has incredible pacing. Yep. Um, it, the morality of the book is really nice. Everything about it is 
is designed to appeal to a young reader and to keep them going through the whole thing. And it's it's brilliantly done. I it's it's absolutely still one of my favorite books. Okay. Yeah, no, I yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a brilliant book. And just like the setup of like preparing for a death, but also the subversion of spoilers, it's not mm-hmm. the one you thought. That's just yeah. I cannot get over that. Like imagine to if you took that same concept and applied it to a crime novel where you spent the entire time thinking character X would die but character Y died, you know? It's it's just very well crafted. I'm almost positive I read that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Next on the line we have Jamie Thomas on the line right now all the way from Wenatchee, Washington. Jamie Thomas, uh, what was the first book that you remember uh, reading that made you cry? Oh, no. Okay. So, um, goodness gracious. Um, well, there I is a... have never read Goodness Gracious. Who is that by? <laughs> well, you should. It's terribly good. Um, do you mean, you don't mean my books where I cry because it's so bad and I can't write anything, right? I mean, you're meaning other people's. <laughs> if that was the first book, sure. <laughs> no. Um. So there is an author, I think she is Australian, um, Juliette Marie, and um, she uh, writes books that take place in um, ancient Ireland and Scotland, and um, and uh, she wrote a book, and I think it was back in 1999, called um, Daughter of the Forest, and uh, it is a retelling of the Seven Swans, which is a very famous Irish legend, and um, I just one of my favorite books of all time. I love this book um, until the day I die. But I never read a book that was so bittersweet at the end, where you had that curious mix of being absolutely devastated um, for for one reason, but absolutely elated for the other. And I'd never had a book that was so gray area to me before. Um, I think that I had read a lot of books that just simply ended very neat and tidy. And um, I, cr- I cried at the end of that one. And um, I just, uh, it, it kind of taught me that sometimes that's what makes a book great is um, is those emotions that are not black and white or not uh, cut and dry. And um, I think that was the, the really the first one that I ever felt that uh, emotional about. And that just, I mean, she's a brilliant storyteller. So that's just a... Um, you know, if anything, a tribute to how great she is. But that that very curious sense when you read a book that it's very um, melancholy, but also hopeful in that same way. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Tracy Waddleton, who is from Trapassi, Newfoundland. She recently just put out a book through Breakwater Books called Send More Tourists, The Last Ones Were Delicious, which is a collection of absolutely wonderful and hilarious and surreal and dreamlike short stories. I got sent this by someone at Breakwater and read through it, and it is just hilarious. Like, they sent it to me and said... We have something that's up your alley, Matt. And I'm like, what? And they weren't wrong. It's uh, it's pretty amazing short stories. But yeah, we have the author on right now. She's been getting great uh, reviews from Brooke Davis and Joel Thomas Hines and just a lot of, lot of awards buzz. Uh, she's been published in Riddle Fence, The Telegram, Newfoundland Quarterly, Paragon, The Cover Anthology. You are just blowing up. Oh, well, I don't know about that, but I, I'm really glad that you like the collection. All right. What is the first book, uh, Tracy Waddleton, that ever made you cry? Oh, my goodness. That made me cry? Yes. That's difficult. Yes. I can tell you the first books that terrified me. Um, All right, I well. remember the first time I read about sex but i don't remember a book making me cry okay what was the first book that terrified you it was definitely stephen king i'm thinking it was it that'll do it thinking it was it i was reading it it in my room when i was a kid and it was so thick you know it was one of the little mass market paperbacks and i was so terrified i don't think i slept for that whole week i just was like i couldn't read it beyond a certain point in the evening and i had to put it down but it would just sit in my head all night. And then, of course, the next day I pick it up because I wanted to know what happened. 
and then the whole process would start again. It was it was horrible. I remember thinking, like, why are people writing this kind of stuff? Why are they doing this to me? But um, it's also, you know, it was also really great. And uh, then there was that movie with John Ritter and everything. It was pretty, it was one of the things I came to love in my childhood, but it was pretty harrowing the first time. How have you, uh, have you gotten to see the new version? Uh, yeah, I saw the first part. Yeah, it was okay. I think the second part of the original movie was, was better than like the part where they're kids so i'm thinking that i'm hoping the second part that's coming out i'm hoping that that one redeems the first one a little bit if i had In my brain they're still part of the same story if i had time uh, like all the time in the world and absolutely nothing to do with my day like was independently wealthy and didn't have to work or do anything i would cut together on my computer two versions of it one that takes the kid kids in the um the new version and then cuts it together with the old old version of the adults and Mm -hmm. then does the uh, like cut it together weird so that the wrong adults are paired with the wrong kids just to see what that does with the story (laughs) that's what you would do with your time that's what i would do with my time just just that's great just see how Tim Curry plays against this new, like, crazy, weird one. Yeah, did you? Which one do you think is scarier? I don't know. I find modern horror not terribly scary because it's all like focused on jump scares, but like still yeah. images of the current one I find pretty scary. Like he he looks creepier, well as Tim Curry just kind of looked like a clown. Yeah. Well, old horror is about suspense more so than than just, like, the cheap jump scare, like what you're talking about. Yeah. And I feel like that's been lost a lot. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of old horror movies, but new stuff doesn't really impress me very much. Every so often, something new will come out. Like, uh, It Follows a few years ago. I that, was just going to say that. That was really good. That one... That was a really good movie. That stuck with me. Like, I, I that was a while getting that out of my head. Yeah, I like that one, and I well, I haven't seen the one with Tony Collette. What is that called? Hereditary. Hereditary. Yeah. I haven't People seen it either. That's scary. It actually looks really freaky to the point where I'm I'm like I'm old now, and I'm like I don't I don't know if I <laughs> want to be this scared anymore. <laughs> Me too. I'm like okay, that's, that's too much. It's like, and uh, yeah, it's like too far. I, I'm ragging on old like new horror movies because they're not scary enough but yet when one presents itself to me i'm like i don't know yeah i need like a group of girlfriends to sleep over that night and uh we'd have to stay up all night until it was daylight and then maybe everything would be okay but so i don't know if i could watch it by myself you know my best friend even though he's 35 uh he has never watched horror movies because he will still not be able to sleep at night he just can't handle them and his mm-hmm. girlfriend and I d- both love horror movies, and so now we'll sit down every Friday and basically subject him to a horror movie marathon. Oh, no. And it's really <laughs> funny to watch this very burly, like, 35-year-old man, like, cowering in fear. It's amazing. <laughs> that sounds terribly, terribly cruel. It sounds... I, I kind of see the appeal. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Laura Lana Dunn, the superstar short story author who recently put out her first full novel, Ashes, which came out in June 2020 from Engine Books. Laura Lana Dunn, what's the first book you ever read that you remember making you cry? I want to say where the red fern grows. Everyone says that. I think because it was required reading in school. Yeah. And if I, re- like, I think I was sick that week, so I kind of was reading it at home. And, you know, like the stereotypical book lover does, after Lights Out, I was reading, you know, like Under My Covers with a Flashlight kind of thing. And I got to the part towards the end that, of course, is kind of tragic. And I was very upset and, and the language, if I'm remembering correctly, the description that was used was also kind of gross. Yeah. <laughs> at least to me at the time, who was a 10 or an 11 year old, like the idea of a 10 year old reading that story as a, to me as an adult seems very strange. Yeah. It seems, you know, higher reading level. 
subject matter. Anyway, um, although now that I've said that, I might circle back and s- remove that and say Old Yeller. Yeah. Old Yeller was a few years earlier. Anything that has to do with a sad ending that involves dogs, I suppose, seems to be the theme here. Yeah. 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 Where the wit red fern grows seems like it's just like I, I hadn't read it. I don't know how I missed that in my school life, but you you've got to be the fifth author who's named that one um, for that particular question, and it's so mind boggling. Paul Carberry explained it to me, and he was like, "So it's this boy, and he owns a dog, and then that dog dies." And then he's sad and he gets over it and his parents tell him he needs to get a new dog. So he finally gets over it and he gets a new dog and then that dog dies. And I was like... That's not how I remember it at all. But I'm sitting here like, who writes that? That's not. There's not even a moral there. Like, that is the most nihilistic book description I've ever heard of. Life is pain and then is more pain when you try to get over pain. And who writes it geared towards children? Right. Mother- Specifically. Again, like Old Yeller, like it's a story of a boy and his dog, and then the boy kills his dog. Like, that's terrible. Mm hmm. <laughs> yep. That is. If Marley and Me came out in movies, and I was like, no, I know where this is going. Nope, not watching it. Not doing it. Yep. Yep. I, I did watch Marley and Me, and that is. Uh, I didn't read it, I watched the, the movie with Owen Wilson, which. Um, Owen Wilson doing dramatic stuff. I'm always just like, what's... Who who was the casting director here? Yeah, I saw him in a Woody Allen film once. It's very bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um... Yeah, strange. Stuff with dogs is, is always hard. Yeah, I think it's that common denominator kind of thing. Most people, if you even if you don't own a dog, you've probably had a dog that you've played with and have liked. You know, your friend's dog or something. And yeah. Then, uh... Although cats too. Oh hey, I'm I'm a cat person. Yeah, me too. But like, I, I can't think of as many examples in fiction because like usually a cat wouldn't. Um, like oftentimes if there's violence done to a dog in fiction, it's like the the dog is protecting the protagonist or the child of the protagonist or something like that, and almost dies. So it's equally tragic. You know what I mean? Like it's even more tragic, I should say. Cats aren't like that, so it's it's rarer, you know. Um, but I've seen it a couple times, and it, it is it is a gut punch every time. Yeah, it's just ooh, ooh. Yep. Anyway, that that book, one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next up, we have BC Labeled, the Canadian independent author of the Tenth Lunan Regiment series, a military sci-fi saga. He also writes an immersive dark fantasy series. His current titles include To Drown in Sand, Juris Lunance, To Drown in Ash, The Dog, Bone, and Upon a Wake of Flame. Uh, BC Label, what is the first book that you recall that ever made you cry? Um, that would be Stephen King's Last Rung on the Ladder. Okay. It's a short story, and I think it's in Skeleton Crew. Okay. That's awesome. Okay, yeah, I like, I like King. I, I believe I've read that one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, probably. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Morgan Murray, author. Currently, he has the book Dirty Birds with Breakwater Book. Uh, Morgan Murray, what is the first book you ever read that made you cry? First book I ever read that made me cry? Oh, jeez. Um... First book I ever read that made me cry. I'm trying to think hard, go back far. It was probably. Did, so, I want to clarify technicality here. Do I, I have to be the one who read it to myself, or could it have been a book that was read to me? It can be a adult? book that was read to you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, my mom was a really big fan of all sad books, and so she would <laughs> always like read us as bedtime stories books like um where the red fern grows i don't know if you're familiar with that one i am that has uh, been the answer uh, a bunch of times yeah yeah man that book why would you read that to your children yeah uh, <laughs> so my mom read that to us and like she read a lot of the 
like My Little Pony or whatever those books are, where the horse always dies. Um, so it's probably one of those ones. I don't remember. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, not the dead animals part, but, you know, the, yeah, the, the reading. Yeah, sounded great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Josh Connors. Uh, he is the author of Small Town Queer, both the uh, play and the adaptation. Uh, Josh Connors, what is the first book you can ever remember reading that made you cry? A separate piece. Again, never heard of it. What's that about? We had to study it in uh, grade school, and I, again, was not much of a reader, couldn't stand it, did not have the attention span to sit down and read a book, um, <coughs> but I was getting further up in my schooling, and, you know, you can probably get away with that in grade seven and eight, but as you get higher up, if you don't know the book, <laughs> you're not going to pass the exam at the end of the year, and then you'll have to stay back. Um, so it's about these two... Uh, young kids who, uh, if I remember all the details correctly, um, they meet at like a camp setting and they become best friends. And one of them, um, one of them is a little mentally off okay. and uh, makes some poor decisions. And the other one is always there to protect him. Um, there's a lot of uh, undertones that the relationship is more than what it is but because the book is quite old at the time that it came out a uh, it probably wouldn't have touched on that relationship it would have just alluded to it okay. um but i remember reading it and feeling all the emotions that he was going through because i was still trying to you know figure out my sexuality and all that kind of stuff so watching his heartbreak through it i remember that was the first book that i ever uh, you know broke down and cried while reading okay all right that's important. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Tasha Madison, the author of Fabric of a Generation. Tasha Madison, what is the first book that ever made you cry? First book that ever made me cry? It probably was Where the Red Fern Grows. <laughs> that um, damn that, book. Yep. That book was, I mean, it's probably was something I didn't expect. I mean, you, I don't, you know, I don't expect to get attached to something like that. Um, but I mean, yeah, when the, the dogs die, I mean, I, I was kind of mad at my teacher for making us read this. I'm like, why did you make us read this book? Yep. Um, you know, I was, it was so sad. Um, and so emotionally moving. Um, yeah, I think that probably was the first time a book made me cry in the fifth grade reading where the red fern grows. Um, it just was beautiful. Um, and horribly sad at the same time. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you very much. Next up, we have the author of Alligator and February, Lisa Moore. Lisa Moore, uh, what is the first book you remember that ever made you cry? Black Beauty. Wow, that's a callback. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's a beautiful story about a horse. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, I yes, I remember breaking my heart, but I guess probably a lot of uh, girls ha felt that way about that book. Maybe boys did too, but I know a lot of girls did. Girls oh, and horses. Did, yeah. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Sarah Thompson, who in February released her first book through Engine Books called The Love of Summer. Sarah Thompson, what is the first book that ever made you cry? Oh God, it's really hard to make me cry. I mean, I mean that really, really literally. It could be cry with laughter. Do you think I read funny things? I, I do. Uh, um, have you ever read a blog called uh, Men Writing Women? That'll make you cry. Oh, God. I can only imagine. Uh, what that made me cry? I keep going back to... It's not called Stand By Me, though. And it's only a short story. The Body? The Body. That, that is an excellent book. That Yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, yeah. What's really funny is that I had read it and didn't know that there was any connection to a movie because I'm in that weird generation that like, Stand By Me was sort of huge in my youth, but I was just a little bit too young to have watched it when it first came out. Yeah. So when I started, well, I started reading a ton of Stephen King and came across a story and just like freaking loved it and was talking about it. And my dad came home with the, VHS of Stand By Me. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.